Okay, I'm not going to lie to you. If you asked me if I'd like to watch a documentary about a telemarketing scam, I probably would have just said no, but I would have been wrong. Today, HBO has a new documentary called Telemarketers. You'll hear why it's one of the most talked about shows of the summer. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. You're listening to Commotion. I imagine this scenario is familiar to you, right? You're sitting at home, you're minding your own business, your phone rings. You don't really recognize the number, but you take the call anyway, and then something like this happens. Hello, uh, Sam Lipman Stern, calling on behalf of the Washington, D.C. Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge Number 1. Good evening. That is from HBO's docuseries Telemarketers, and the voice that you just heard is Sam Lipman Stern, who you're about to hear from in just a moment. But let me tell you about Telemarketers, okay? Telemarketers begins by taking you into the world of a call center, only it's not anything like you imagined a call center to be. There is just chaos all over the place. It is run by a company called Civic Development Group. Sam and his buddy at work end up finding out, you know what? This company may be into a scam, maybe doing some shady business. And then they start looking into it. I caught up with Sam yesterday to talk about all of this. And just a heads up, there's going to be a couple spoilers in there. Hey, Sam Lippman Stern, uh, Fraternal Order of Police. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Just, just you using my voice. I'm like, I, I, <laughs> how do I give you money? I just want, I just want to do that. Um, <laughs> man, I'm so interested in telemarketers because you put on the show. And then as you begin to watch it, it's this incredible behind-the-scenes footage of CDG where you used to work. But we see people getting tattoos at work. We see people doing drugs at work. We see people falling asleep, just, I don't know, playing what it looked like, I don't know, maybe baseball, but with a water cooler. It just, just like the nuttiest kind of stuff possible. And you go, this is like not a real workplace. You have this beautiful sort of opening to the show where you say, I just wanted to film me and my friends doing dumb things. And like that's how I ended up picking up a camera. Why did you end up sort of begin to film this 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 place where you worked in the first place? So I, I first started filming at, at CDG. I was a teenager um, and all the characters like that you, you're describing were just so fascinating. I mean, here you had a lot of high school dropouts like myself, some college kids, but mostly you know, ex-cons. So people that were just out of prison and they were living in a halfway house and they got maybe their parole officer said, hey, you can work at this place called CDG. They'll hire you with a with a felony or with, you know, with that uh, with a criminal record. Yeah. So but what that did is it made there were just so many interesting people with crazy stories working <laughs> there. And as long as you made your money, which was about two hundred dollars an hour, you could basically do whatever you wanted in the office. Like you said, people were, you know, selling massive amounts of drugs, any kind of drug you wanted, you could get it there. Yeah. Um, you know, there is um, people selling one guy came in selling pit bulls one day. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. There's, I mean, it was literally any, it was a marketplace, but everyone would share their stories between calls. Yeah. So when you weren't talking to someone, you'd be sharing your story. Um, and you had all these really interesting people. Uh, one day I was talking to a, a friend of mine on the phone, like a, another caller, Big Ed, who's in episode one. And I, and he was like, you know, look, dude, like we're all a bunch of losers. Like you're a teenager. Like you probably, this isn't your dream. You can't, you don't want to be a telemarketer for life. What do you want in life? And I was like, I want to be a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. And I would love to film this place, you know? And he said, bring in your camera tomorrow. Wow. And he was like an authority figure there because he was a manager. And uh, we just started filming the shenanigans, the office hijinks at first. Well, so you're you're filming yourself, you know, basically calling people saying, hey, I'm Sam Littmister and I represent the Fraternal Order of Police. Would you like to give money for the, you know, families of fallen officers? That's a script that you guys all have. You have all these rebuttals for when anybody says, oh, I really can't. My spouse is not home. You're like, we got it. We have a response. My house, to- my house just burned down. Right. We got it. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we can respond to that thing that yeah. they're saying. But then as you're working this job, you start to be like, OK, some Something is amiss here. This might be a scam. How did that start to come about for you? Well, when people would ask us how – originally, when people would ask us how much 
if if you ask me, well, well, I want to donate to the police, but how much of my donation goes? Yeah. By law, we had to tell them, well, a very generous 10% of your donation goes. And so, they're like, wait, so they wait, give a hundred bucks and then $10 of that is going to the, the thing that exactly. they said. Okay. All right. Yeah. And charity experts say that it should be a, a minimum of 70% going to the cause and 30% for fundraising. Right. But the management would always say 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Right. They would always say that. But then I think what really got me thinking was we saw there was some kind of a 10 o'clock news story, local news story about a, a veterans charity that got caught pocketing the money. And that was one of our clients. Right. They didn't really go into the too deep into the story. It was a very quick one. But they were like, you know, this was a scam veterans charity. Uh, that we were calling on behalf of. And that's when I started thinking, okay, wait, this is, uh, we're, we're involved in something bigger than, 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 than I thought. So then there's this point in the, in the, in the show where you and your coworker, Pat, you decide, you know what, we're going to take filming a bit more seriously to document what is happening here. This is no longer, we're just filming shenanigans, but like something is going on. We're going to try to find out what it is. Take a listen to this. Pat felt certain that the cops we called on behalf of had gotten away with something. So we spent the next couple of years looking for the proof. Hey guys, uh, Patrick J. Pespis. I have a list here of charities. Now personally, I called for every one of these charities. Maybe CDG gave them bad rap, maybe they're bad charities, we don't know. But I do want to give them a chance to respond and get their side of the story. So the dynamic shifts, right? The dynamic shifts from, you know what, we are just filming the ridiculousness of this workplace to actually we are now kind of actively engaged in some kind of investigation. As things start to get more serious, the in, did the environment around you shift at all? Did people were still people were people still willing to be like as candid with you? I think that yeah, so the thing is I I kind of grew up there. You know, I grew up at CDG with all these guys and and women and men, you know. Um, And so they saw me go from a teenager to, you know, a guy in his early 20s that wanted to do a documentary. I don't think they ever thought it was going to turn into anything. It's just Sam and Pat doing their crazy little project. But they were supportive. And, you know, the callers were the people like the callers were always really supportive. Right. Um, and in terms of some of those characters and how they show up, like they literally do show up again in the third episode of this. So we're talking 20 years from the first time they started filming. They're still in the industry. They're still willing to sort of give you a lot of information that I was like really surprised they were willing to just volunteer. They still work in that industry. But you got to I guess you had that trust because you've been doing this for such a long time, right? Yeah, there was this com- camaraderie, you yeah. know, it was just this, dysfun- this very dysfunctional family. I mean, I think the fact that a lot of these guys were willing to talk is also kind of a testament to the industry and that they're not really treated that well. They're not really respected at their jobs. And so they're like, hey, yeah, I'll talk to Sam. Well, I have because they don't have any allegiance to these companies yeah. that at was, all. I, I, think, I think that was a surprising part to watch is like you were talking about somebody who I think you identified them as like still working for one of those telemarketing companies. But we did see him earlier in, this, in the show. So we knew that he was like one of your earlier friends. But he is almost like – honestly, what was amazing about watching that was like the camera kind of disappeared for a moment as you were – you know, as Pat and that guy were talking in that final episode – and it really struck me that their loyalty to you was stronger than their loyalty to this industry that they've been in for 20 years or so. Yeah, totally. Especially in, especially now that it's going towards like a- AI and robocalls yeah. where, you know, the one – we never wanted to demonize the callers in this series, right? Yes. We never wanted to demonize, demonize the people that are – just regular folks trying to get a job and they don't know, they didn't know it was a scam. And we, you know, you know, they weren't looking into it. They're just, you know, they got landed the job through the prison or whatever it was, or, or they couldn't get another job because of, you know, lack of education. You know, these are people just trying to get a job. We never wanted to demonize uh, them. Yeah. But where we are now is it's starting to go. The technology is leading towards artificial intelligence and robocalls. Yeah. Where, in episode three, we get a call from one of our friends who passed away right, a year ago, and his robot robotic voice is calling us from beyond the grave. 
And so you're the one positive element, in my opinion, about this industry, which is giving people that are unemployable jobs. Yeah. Now that's being that's that's going away. And I think that's another reason why folks are willing to talk to us because they realize, hey, man, the one good part of this is it, it might not be here in 10 years. I mean, what, what was really striking about that part is we started out watching what you sort of would describe in the in the doc as a bunch of misfits who have kind of gathered to be in this place. And one of one of your uh, one of the people that you interviewed laid it out so beautifully, like, it isn't it a little bit wild that the people that, you know, who the society is afraid of are the people in charge of putting money in the safes of police? Because like that is, you know, part of what we're doing here. But what was crazy to me is that as you tried to get to the truth of what was happening in the sense of you're trying to uncover, hey, who's in charge of regulating these people and who's in charge of actually keeping us safe in this? And Pat, who's a person that we end up following throughout this whole series, um, does not end up testifying. And he does not – he ends up being sort of denied the opportunity to become the voice of the pain that that industry has caused for a lot of people. What do you make of that David versus Goliath dynamic? Like, Why do you think it didn't end up going anywhere in that sense? You know, I think it's one of the big parts of the story is that, you know, the major police organizations are involved with this and they're, they've been getting lots of money from it for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we were calling on behalf of yeah, police organizations, but the biggest police organization in the United States and in the world, which is the uh, Fraternal Order of Police. And then all and then also um, firefighters, veterans and cancer organizations but it's these major legitimate police organizations and, and police unions that are totally wrapped up in this scam. And I think what we learned is that politicians don't want to go against those police organizations for whatever reason. And it seems to be more for like electability. Like they don't, you know, a, a guy running for go a guy running for governor doesn't want to be on the other side of yeah. the major police union or um, that's what I kind of gathered from it. So I think I think that I'm really curious to see if some of these major police organizations start speaking out against this. I mean, you know, we're talking about a billion dollar scam and a lot of money that could be going to good causes. Yeah. And 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 most of the char the charities that we were calling on behalf of, we were calling for legitimate police organizations, real police organizations, and then sound alike scam veterans and cancer and now autism they use these other charities that sound like legitimate ones like right. maybe the you know american i'm just making up a name american cancer foundation is legit but well they made the 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 foundation of american cancer not yeah. a legit right. total scam so so this industry is keeping these scam organizations going but i think the legitimate police organizations really need to stand up and say, hey, we were involved in this. We're not proud of it, but we're not going to support it any longer. But I think there, it seems like the hope, you know, I'm curious to see where this goes. Yeah. And I hope that there really is some pressure uh, to make some change. They had offices in Canada as well. So mm -hmm. it was CDG had offices across the United States and in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've been getting emails from, from callers that worked on the phones in Canada and in the United States oh, wow. saying, hey, you know, this was I worked in this industry, you know, it was crazy. Our office is just like yours and anything I could do to help, let us know. So, you know, you're you're sitting in and describing this sort of elaborate scam universe. But I think what made the documentary cut through, because like, I think people have been, you know, doing reporting on, um, you know, telemarketing scams for some time. But what made this sure. documentary cut through is like how deeply entertaining and warm, you know, that footage is, that, especially in the very first episode, because you're, you make a connection with the people. You make a connection with all of your friends. You make a question, this connection with everybody as they're sort of telling the story. And they're, they're sort of like giving you, you know, the business for being like, hey, don't act like you weren't a part of it. You're a part of it too, Sam, <laughs> um, which is just, it's just so great, you know? Um, but it got me sort of thinking about the fact that right now, in every workplace, we all have our phones. We all have cameras accessible to us all the time. Um, it felt like you being behind the camera at that time, like that's the thing that made the dynamic work. Do you think you could make this documentary now? That's a really good question. I mean, yeah, I think that there's something really special to the fact that we were 
this the early footage was before the era of having uh camera you know cameras in our our, our cell phones yeah and and it was just one camera so everyone was kind of paying attention to the camcorder that that i had yeah also there's something about the look and not to get too nerdy but i love the look and feel of that footage from the late 90s early 2000s i know it was a lot of us like our generation grew up with you know if you're a millennial or whatever that was the first camera maybe your family had or your yes. parents and we all have these tapes sitting in a closet somewhere and they've got this really nice warm feel i mean i wouldn't yeah i'd say i think that the the era and capturing that era that time period i think to make this exact doc i think it had to be from that era that being said i you know the the time period we're in now where you have everyone has a 4k camera yeah. in their phone i mean people are doing you know incredible things with, yeah. with those and i hope we see more interesting office footage taken with with you know modern technology <laughs> well that's I, I guess like that's what i'm trying to get at right is that like the you had the camera sort of fixed on yourself as you're making some of these calls and then like a, a, a sort of a coworker would walk by and see the camera and they just start making faces at it yeah and, <laughs> and honestly like it made me kind of emotional watching that because like that's what you did when there was a camera and somebody had a camera on you just kind oh, of yeah. all clamored for like the attention of the thing you know and then like when you would post like the stuff on youtube you had to like go out to search for the thing that you wanted to find but now a all of us have these cameras so it kind of feels like we're weirdly monitoring ourselves all the time so we don't do that you know what i mean totally i never yeah. thought about it like that and you're but you're totally right i mean those re those reactions in the background i mean this was a new thing this camcorder yeah. having a camcorder that you could bring into your office to bring around with you and your friends was a totally new technology yeah at that time period and it was and and people didn't know how to react. You're totally right. It's a, the way we think about the camera yeah. is very different than we did yeah. back in the early 2000s. Um, and I think you're I think that is why we get some of those great reactions. If it was me with a cell phone filming, we we wouldn't get those same reactions. No, I, I think people would kind of be maybe numb to it in a in a way that is like not really reactive yeah. but then also like you have this added dimension of you know the first footage that you that you took you uploaded to youtube well youtube wasn't this sort of like open space where anybody could find anything at any point you kind of had to know what you were searching for in order to find it and now totally. that youtube's algorithm is just kind of like bringing you stuff just kind of randomly everyone is a bit more careful with it which is why watching telemarketers kind of felt like a beautiful kind of time capsule of this just pre-social media internet kind of moment it was you know it was right when youtube came out that yeah. we started posting those videos and back then youtube was just like i mean every it was so exciting you know oh wow i can actually broadcast our videos yeah. even though they're getting you know 25 views or 30 <laughs> views or whatever yeah. it exists you know it exists in this world and, and it really is a a, a, a time capsule of, of that time period for sure so uh, the the documentary spends a lot of time with you following around pat um by the end of the doc you really end up falling in love with pat i can't let you go without asking you about how pat is doing right now how pat how is pat doing in terms of the reaction to how the documentaries come out and all of that so pat is doing you know you see his journey from you know being in addiction and yeah. now thank god because we lost a lot of people died over the years in that industry there's a yes. lot of especially with fentanyl now and um pat is in recovery he's sober yeah. uh he's he's doing great he's uh right now he's really focusing on his wife his wife has some ailments yeah but they're pretty blown away by the response. I mean, they're, mm. you know, Pat's been getting recognized in New Jersey. And oh, he's wow. like, ah, I, was, I was at McDonald's and this lady came up and, and that's take a picture with me. And he's just, <laughs> I mean, he's blown away. He's blown away by the whole thing. Um, but he's doing really good. Like, thank, uh, and I, you know, I thank God for that because, you know, both of us, you know, at that time period when we started, we could have gone, you know, we were work, walking on the edge. And yeah. uh, the fact, you know, I, I hope, uh, it, it, it you know i think pat's story especially in of recovery is really inspiring yeah. because it's not easy 
I, I don't. I hope people will forgive me for the spoiler because, like, at the end of episode two, there's this moment where your heart kind of like collapses and you go, Oh my God, I hope Pat is okay. So it is a relief to hear that Pat is doing well. Thank you so much for your time, man. Telemarketing is wonderful. I highly recommend that people just go out and watch it. Thanks. Thanks I again. I really Sam. appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, man. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Sam Lippman Stern co directed the documentary series Telemarketers. It is streaming now on Crave. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. You're listening to Commotion. Listen, I get to play you some new music. I'm really excited about this. You might have heard earlier this week the winners of this year's Legacy Awards were announced. The, the Legacy Awards are the awards to celebrate black achievement in film, television, music, sports, and culture. And among this year's winners, we got Julie Black, we got Tanya Williams, we got Director X, and Lou Kala. She'll take home this year's Emerging Artist Award. She's got the single called Pretty Girl Era. It was huge. It was a huge hit on social media. And it ended up spending 15 weeks on Canada's top 40 charts. So here she is, Lou Kala and Pretty Girl Era. That's Lukala with Pretty Girl Era, one of this year's winners at the Legacy Awards. That ceremony, by the way, is going to happen on September 24th, and you can watch it on CBC and CBC Gem. Truly a one of a kind voice. Kenny Loggins, Michael McDonald, this is it. This is a song that no matter how much you debate the phrase yacht rock, it absolutely fits in the canon of yacht rock. Tomorrow on this very show, we're going to be talking to the creators of the phrase yacht rock. You'll hear about their comedic podcast, Yacht or Nyat, which is a fantastic title. In the meantime, enjoy some more Kenny Loggins. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow.